All right, Does it, uh, that sounds more like it. Great, welcome everybody this evening. Um, I'm Layla Taylor, she, her pronouns, associate curator of programs here, and I'm um, really happy to see you. Thanks for coming out in this first week of February. Um, January, <laughs> not February yet. Um, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. <clears throat> Please do take a moment right now to just pause in your day, take a pause, and reflect on the land that we live on, we work on, and we play on. Here at the Henry Art Gallery, we live and work on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples and the shared waters of all tribes and bands, named and unnamed, including but not limited to the Suquamish, Duwamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. The land acknowledgement, though incomplete, reminds us of our connections, indebtedness, and responsibilities to the peoples and the more than human kin where we live and work. We invite you to join us in paying respects to elders past, present, and future, today, tomorrow, and always, and to consider what paying those respects means within the work that we do as individuals, and especially within these institutional frameworks, like the university and the Henry. Um, I'd like to do some acknowledgements first um, before providing some remarks. Um, I'd especially love to thank um, Professor Chris Tuton tonight, who's joining us for a lecture. Um, and um, I'd like to thank my colleague, um, Danielle Klang, for incredible stellar coordination of this event. Um, I'd like to thank UW Bookstore, or U Bookstore, who's our partner, um, selling Chris's book, Cherokee Earth Dwellers, out in the hall. Um, and I would like to acknowledge um, Adam Monahan, the curator of Apolitical Rocks, um, the exhibits in the North Galleries right outside. Um, he is also the author of the remarks that I'm about to read to you today. Um, and the essay that's available in the exhibition galleries. Um, he's unable to make it tonight, which is why he's not making these remarks. Um, he played an instrumental part in the development of this evening's program. So in Adam's words, <clears throat> I want to propose tonight that we think of photography first, not as art or representational tool, but as language. As with any language, Photography has the ability to profoundly shape our engagement with the world, mediating experience through its specific syntax. Tonight, we think of language of photography with respect to the photographs in Apolitical Rocks, which are two dozen images drawn from the Henry Collection from across the 19th and 20th centuries by several of the most famed photographers of the landscape of the so-called American West. As Susan Sontag wrote in her seminal 1977 on photography, photographs can abet desire in the most direct, utilitarian way. This situation is quietly indexed in the earliest image in Apolitical Rocks, which attests to the medium's alliance with American institutions of control and drives for westward settler colonial expansion. The language of photography found new motivation in the United States' increasing desire for land and mineral riches in the wake of the Civil War, and in turning to the vast unmapped territory of the West, initiated a new genre of seeing. As Apolitical Rocks attempts to show, we still live with these legacies, both with respect to the ongoing settler occupation of unceded indigenous lands, and the persistence of scenes and sites first captured and codified by photographers like Timothy O'Sullivan, Carlton Watkins, and others in our imaginations. It's not the language of photography alone, however, that has shaped new understandings of the American West, but also the English language. While the language of photography framed new ways of seeing, created new scenic sites, the English language gave them new names and assigned them new associations. Locally, we might think of Mount Rainier, named in English in the late 18th century by the British naval explorer George Vancouver in honor of a friend. 
It's almost incidental act of naming that over 200 years later still obscures the many indigenous names for the mountain and shapes popular understanding of our regional landscapes. And I'd like to add that in the native language of Twalshutsi, the mountain is pronounced Tequoma. The Puyallup tribes launched an effort several years ago to change the name, though it remains unchanged today. The work of Chris Tutan, tonight's speaker, to takes language seriously for the way that it shapes understanding. In his Cherokee Earth Dwellers, he has documented the unique ways the Cherokee language encodes cultural tradition. And as he notes in the introduction to the book, however, the Cherokee language has since the arrival of Anglo-American settlers suffered a persistent, quote, persistence and often coercive shift to English from Cherokee as the common language of community, unquote. And consequently, Tutun writes, quote, Cherokee has suffered a diminishment of its lexicon. As the number of first language speakers declines, so too do the number of words people know and use to describe their world, unquote. As he shows, the Cherokee language and its unique features, vocabulary, produces a distinct worldview. And it is these specific cultural differences, he writes, quote, created through relationships with place that shape our unique unique ways of defining, engaging, and understanding our world, unquote. So while photography's entanglement with colonial culture produces one vision of nature and one set of relations to the land, Teuton demonstrates an alternative through the lens of the Cherokee language, and one that I'm excited for him to share with us this evening. But first, a brief introduction. Chris Tutun is professor and chair of the Department of American Indian Studies at the University of Washington, where he teaches courses on indigenous literature and storytelling, indigenous studies, and indigenous research methods. His scholarship involves indigenous oral and written literary studies, community-based cultural heritage, and language revitalization work, and fieldwork exploring the perpetuation of indigenous arts and epistemologies. He's published three books, including the most recently, Cherokee Earth Dwellers, Stories and Teachings of the Natural World, published by UW Press in 2023, which was co-created with the late Cherokee national treasures, Hastings Shade and Loretta Shade, and presents a Cherokee ecology explored through Cherokee creature names, environmental relationships, traditional stories, and philosophical discussions with fluent Cherokee speakers and knowledge keepers. His leadership and his service focus on increasing the understanding, reach, and impact of Native American and indigenous studies as an academic discipline grounded in indigenous research methods that arise from the ethical, sustainable, and living knowledges of indigenous communities. Professor Tutan will speak about indigenous relations to land, plants, and creatures through the lenses of oral traditional knowledge and cultural revitalization tonight. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Chris Tutan. Siona God, hello everyone. That was a lot, right? <laughs> I was like, wow. Thank you for that introduction. That was, that was great. Uh, so good to be with you here tonight, and thank you again for coming out. Um, I know there's, Leila and I were just kind of commiserating how there's always so much to do here in Seattle and at the UW, and so, you know, in a, on a, you know, at five o'clock on a, on a Thursday evening when it's dark out uh, and there's other things to do. Thanks you, thank you for coming, thank you for coming. Um, I really look forward to sharing um, some of my work with you today and talking about um, this really kind of um, a topic that's, of course, close to my heart and something that I think is very interesting. I'm reminded of some of my elders um, who have been who told an anecdote of being invited to a, a local school where they, they were given three hours to talk about Cherokee oral tradition. They said, wow, three hours? You know, how are we going to fill up that time? And, of course, once they got there and started talking, <laughs> you know, the time just flew by and then they were, you know, they were done. They were like, we, we didn't even scratch the surface. So I feel like that is a warning, fair warning tonight that I'm that we're just scratching the surface on some of these topics. 
um, that have to do with, with language and place and identity. Uh, and, and the amazing kind of um, work that I had a small part in, in bringing to the world through this publication that I talk about as our publication. When I'm back home in Cherokee community, I talk about it, I say, this is our, our book. And it really has. I'm really gratified that it's, it's, it's become our book, even in the short time since it's been published. It's moving into its third printing. It's being taught in schools. People are using it and telling stories from it. So it's just gratifying to see the legacies of my elders, Hastings Shade and Loretta Shade, and all the contributors of this book kind of moving through the world and these living stories. So um, let me just recap a little bit and just say it's an honor to be with you here today, of course, in Coast Salish territory on traditional Duwamish lands at the University of Washington, which exists along the shared waters of the Muckleshoot, Suquamish, Tulalip, Puyallup, Snoqualmie, and Lummi peoples as well. And I want to start by also thanking um, Layla, um, Danielle, Kling, um, Adam Monahan for inviting me to be part of this program for the, for the um, Henry in general, and just say we're privileged to have the Henry here on campus. It's, it's an amazing institution, so it's wonderful to have him here. Um, so I'm going to start with just an image here. On the image on the left is a picture from my, um, my family's allotment lands and along Honey Creek and what's now Oklahoma, where we, um, we landed when we were moved uh, during the Trail of Tears in 1838 and 39. And I'd like to start with a traditional introduction uh, in the Cherokee language. Uh, Siona God, which means hello, everyone. Um, Aya noi tutan dogadoa, ale jalagi ayetli daguena shani. Echoda, gatio goski skoi. University of Washington, Department of American Indian Studies, dagila wistaneha. Chuta agiji, ale William agadora. Nuk agili. Dagotinaa, wadulisi ogalahoma, ale Colorado aneha. Melissa, aguadalii, nole aguechi avina. Marcus, ale aguechi adanuja. Azalea, Idali Haley Ga, Seattle, George Hai. So I'd like to just start with a little translation of what I just said. Um, in a trip, kind of traditional introduction like this, I said I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, Jalaki Ayetli, um, and I'm also a member of Echota Tanasi Ceremonial Grounds, which is in Park Hill, Oklahoma, our traditional stomp grounds, our religious um, spiritual space. And I also said I, was a, I, I worked at the University of Washington, Dagi uh, Lawista Neha. That word, Dagi uh, Lawista Neha, means my place of work, but more than that, just in that one word, there's something more to it. It means my place of responsibility, my place of communal action and commitment. That word, Dagi Lawista Neha, is the same word that we use when we talk about a council house or we talk about a church. That's what it means to do work within a Cherokee context. It means a place where you have commitment, a place where you do that community action. So just even in a simple word like that, or the simple word of home, what it means to say home in Cherokee language within that introduction, it means the place I return to over and over and over, the place I keep on coming back to. That's home, a place I have a relationship in that way, and I keep coming back to. So just even in that short introduction, which tells you that about my wife, Melissa, my kids, where I come from, um, my citizenship. There's a lot of different language in there that tells something very specific and has specific meanings that shape how we see the world. You know, so moving something from my place of work to a place where, you know, where, where I earn a dollar to a place where I have responsibilities, communal responsibilities, something like that. Um, and for Cherokees and other indigenous peoples, those specific meanings of our language, they're, they're, they're grounded in place, right? They're grounded in relationships. So today I want to present a counter narrative to the history of aestheticizing the landscape of the American West as largely empty of human presence, of history, and of the relations that make up our living world. And uh, just to echo what Layla said, I'm really sorry that Adam can't be here to have that conversation at the end, but I really appreciate those comments to offer some context as we begin this discussion. I was really looking forward to our conversation, and I'll be looking forward to hearing what you all have to say at the end when we have a Q&A as well. So as we begin, I wanna say that these examples of 19th century landscape photography that we see in apolitical rocks, you know, works by 
Ansel Adams, Timothy O'Sullivan, Carlton Watkins, and Edward Weston, and others. You know, I find personally aesthetically beautiful, right? Their interplay of light and shadow, the angles of vision they utilize, and especially the striking ways they capture natural features of place that we've come to know well through photography. Canyon de Chez, El Capitan, the Yosemite Valley. These are raw, overpowering geological images. But not knowing the history of these places, some might even say they look untouched. They look pristine. However, we do know that these places have a rich history of relations with human beings, as well as other living creatures that call them home, places they return to. And if we focus solely on the photographic image that portrays what may seem like a stark landscape to the unknowing eye, we miss so much. Not least of which, we miss the history of the dispossession of these lands and the genocide in this particular case waged against native peoples of California during the gold rush and after. This is a crucial part of the aesthetics of these images. The photos, after all, were taken in the midst of conquest in the latter half of the 19th century, most of them. And this history is fundamental to a full understanding of these images. So as a starting point, I'd suggest folks read, if you don't know about that history, read the work of historian William Bauer about California, Indian dispossession and genocide. Read the work of indigenous studies scholar Kutcher Rising Baldi, which also deals with this, but also looks into the way in which indigenous peoples today are continue, in California are continuing to resist colonization, right? And, uh, and revitalizing their cultural traditions. So I would argue that we're familiar with the photographic aesthetics presented in the image of, of apolitical rocks. In fact, they've shaped mainstream American ways of seeing the natural world. I recall when I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin, I, um, I had a, in my PhD program, I got a minor in, in studies of the American West. And for a few years, I taught a course on um, perceptions of Western landscapes. And one of the things we focused on was images from um, a popular magazine at the time called Outside Magazine. Maybe some of you remember that magazine. It's kind of like, um, you know, that magazine, almost every cover showed something akin to one of those images we see. Uh, I think it was of, um, it was in Yosemite Valley in the Political Rocks exhibit of, you know, people standing on this precipice looking out, right? The settler presence in that. And we see this all the time, these, these images of, you know, man conquering nature, right? We see it in car commercials. It's everywhere nowadays. These images of these amazing, daunting landscapes that human beings have conquered, right? And, um, and this, the similar kind of ways in which we're supposed to be feeling, the creature feeling that comes out in being um, dwarfed by these landscapes is what they often present, right? But that human conquering presence, that settler presence is there. And there's this idea that we can somehow conquer these places, right? Bend them to our will. We could discuss the history of romanticizing conquest by American photography and literature and other forms of American art as well, especially in the 19th century, by portraying the American West as largely empty, uh, with the peoples who have existed here often being portrayed as little more than features in the landscape if they're there at all, right? destined to be swept away in the wake of progress. These images have shaped American ways of understanding the natural world, of the uh, environmental movement, uh, conceptualizing wilderness, the history of our national parks. I mean, we could go on and on about how powerful these images have been in American popular imagination. Native American writers have long engaged this learned perception of the American landscape as empty of people and of cultures. In his foundational work of American Indian literature, the Kiowa Cherokee writer N. Scott Mamaday writes of returning to his ancestral home in Oklahoma, um, a place called Rainy Mountain, and says at the, at the beginning of his work, uh, The Way to Rainy Mountain, this canonical work, that loneliness was part of the land, part of the landscape there. Loneliness was an aspect of the land. Only later, after reflecting on his family and tribe's history of the place, does his perception change. The very bones of his grandmother are buried there. The history is there. All his traditions are there. And in the end, he sees it as a place of of living story, a place of home. But I'd like to shift our focus today 
Instead of allowing settler colonial ways of seeing indigenous landscapes to dictate our conversation, I'd like to center indigenous ways of relating to the world. I'll present to you a cultural understanding of the importance of learning Cherokee creature names and stories as a means of Cherokee language revitalization, the restoration of balanced ecological relations in Cherokee terms, and as an act of decolonial practice. And I'm going to offer a Cherokee way of seeing our world as alive and full of continuing relationships that require care, attention, and love. I'm going to speak to this way of seeing and engage in the natural world by discussing my recent uh, Cherokee community-based publication, Cherokee Earth Dwellers, Stories and Teaching of the Natural World, which as Leda um, said in my introduction, I had the great honor and privilege of writing with uh, the late Hastings Shade, working with his archive of stories and teachings and working with his widow, Loretta Shade, for many years, putting together these, these, this body of knowledge and bringing it forward to share with the world. I'll be describing in an embodied practice of teaching and learning about our living world in Cherokee terms. I won't be speaking of treaties, laws, or property. Those topics have their place, but so does the subject of how we as individuals and cultures embody an everyday, quotidian, living practice of respectfully engaging other forms of life and the way we move through the world. And that's what I'll be talking about today. So I'd like to read, uh, begin by reading you a little, little piece of the book. So this is just the beginning of chapter one. On a warm July afternoon in 2014, I sat in the Branch Restaurant in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, capital of the Cherokee Nation, waiting to meet Loretta Shade and Larry Shade about a book project. Loretta and I had met years before when her late husband, the renowned Cherokee Nation elder and political leader, Hastings Shade, and I collaborated on a book of traditional stories titled Cherokee Stories of the Turtle Island Liars Club. I knew she was a deeply respected elder in her own right, a treasured teacher of the Cherokee language since the 1970s. Hastings had also talked about his son, Larry, the high school coach and teacher, but we had never met. A sedan pulled up to the restaurant. Loretta entered carrying a plastic grocery bag and was a, with a man bearing a striking resemblance to Hastings, only younger and bigger than the elder I knew. Larry must have recognized the expression on my face. Yes, I know I look a lot like him, he said as we shook hands. He sounded like Hastings, too, with a deep, gentle, deep voice. Loretta was as I remembered her, small, with medium-length curly hair, glasses, and a kind, friendly, straightforward manner. We sat down to glasses of iced tea, and Loretta placed on the table the plastic grocery bag she'd been carrying. Inside, covered in pale blue construction paper and bound with rusty binder clips, were catalogs of Cherokee names for creatures of the natural world that Hastings had assembled before his passing. Eight in all, the catalogs were titled birds, animals, insects, fish, reptiles and amphibians, plants, edible plants and trees. The dog-eared booklets appeared unassuming. Uh, when did Hastings begin writing down these names for the natural world? I asked as I thumbed through the collections. The 1970s, Loretta said. He always carried a little notepad with him, Larry said. He would write any old thing down and he would, he would hear the other elders in the community say. He used to say, I got to meet with so-and-so today. They're supposed to have something for me or show me something. A lot of times I went with them, Loretta said, and was very warm meeting and sharing knowledge with that person. You just relate to whatever they were talking about, and you think, well, this person grew up just like me, you know? And a lot of times Hastings would say, so-and-so learned from his grandpa. He'd say, we're going to compare what our gran grandpas knew or grandmas. And that was really good, Loretta said and paused. Hastings was a lifelong student of Cherokee culture. Loretta explained the significance and scope of Hastings' life as a word collector. Making his rounds as a woodman and teacher, Hastings filled pocket-sized notebooks with words, teachings, and knowledge he was raised with and that were shared with him by other Cherokee elders. Later, he transcribed the words and stories from these notebooks and created collections of teachings and his catalogs of Earth's creatures. Working slowly and diligently, Hastings cataloged more than 600 names and stories of the creatures in the Cherokee natural world. Together with all those, shared, those who shared with him, Hastings Shade, had gathered the largest collection of Cherokee names for, for and teachings of the natural world in existence. Now Loretta and her family wish to share Hastings' collection of collected words to contribute to Cherokee cultural and linguistic revitalization. They had approached me as a writer because Hastings grew to trust me during our collaboration on Cherokee stories of the Turtle Island Liars Club. It was always Hastings' intention to publish this work and share it with future generations, Loretta said. 
Hastings saw himself as fighting to keep Cherokee culture alive. I remember what his friend Sequoia once wrote of him. Quote, his weapon is his knowledge and his opponent is the future threatening to drive Cherokee heritage into obscurity. Making Hastings work accessible to a wide audience of readers would continue his legacy of teaching language, culture, and history for generations to come. The Cherokee lifeways that Hastings elders shared with him are rooted in teachings about our place as human beings within a living and interrelated natural world. Loretta explained, Loretta explained, passed down through junilosa, which is our word for culture, or what they have passed on, those teachings instill values and practices that enable people to live in a balanced, healthful way in relation to ourselves and to others. To understand this way of life fully, Hastings said, one would need to be born into it. Quote, there are subjects that are not allowed to be discussed and others that shouldn't be because they're of the family and not for the public, he once wrote. But in his cultural revitalization work, Hastings shared the broad outlines of a reflective practice or way of being focused on living in accord with Cherokee values to establish tohi, or peace or flow in body, mind, and spirit. To live with tohi, Hastings said, is to quote, stand in the middle. Ayetli jidoga, or I stand in the middle. This, I understood, was a vision of a life lived well, a good life as taught to him by elders. His cultural and linguistic revitalization work all centered on the goal of teaching and perpetuating this Cherokee way of life. With humility and gratitude, I accept the responsibility and gift Loretta and her family presented to me to weave together Hastings' archive of names, stories, and teachings into a book. I would need their guidance, as well as the guidance and wisdom of other elders and knowledge keepers to portray the vision of the Cherokee cosmos Hastings shared. Or Hastings shared. We agreed to work together to this end, and that meeting was the origin of Cherokee Earth Dwellers. The next day, I traveled back to my home in Seattle, the bag of Hastings' name books guarded on my lap and my head full of questions. What are the characteristics and patterns of Cherokee natural world Hastings was taught? What is our role as human beings in the Cherokee cosmos? Why is it important to know the creatures with whom we share this world? And what does it mean to stand in the middle? So there you have an image of the books. Um, those blue uh, paper bound books. And I and gave them back to the Shade family, but I have copies of those. But boy, when I was traveling back to Seattle with him in my lap, holding this huge chunk of the Cherokee lexicon in my lap, it was a nerve-wracking experience, right, to have that, uh, the responsibility of carrying those. Um, but these are some images of Hastings, uh, who, like I said, he was a, our former deputy principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, a Cherokee national treasure for, uh, that he was awarded for, um, for passing on the tradition of gigging, which you see here, a traditional way of fishing. Uh, and he's sitting up on top talking to another elder, Sammy Still, another member of the Turtle Island Liars Club, which I'll talk about in a bit. So I want to just take, give you a little bit of a, to backtrack a little bit and tell you about that book, uh, um, Cherokee Stories of the Turtle Island Liars Club, which is what I referenced in that section. Um, this is one that we finished in 2012. And I began to work with, um, with Hastings um, and several other members of the, of the Liars Club on this book um, that portrays a way of understanding Cherokee storytelling through the practice of um, conversation and actually telling of stories. You know, we often, those of us who teach um, American Indian literature is often, you know, we talk about the importance of storytelling practices within indigenous cultures, but it's not just as if native peoples love stories any more than any other people. Uh, it's that the, the, the ways in which those stories um, exist and have meaning within the language itself is what's so powerful. And we started to talk about this within the concept of, of storytelling in Cherokee terms. They're called the Turtle Island Liars Club because in Cherokee language, there's no word for storyteller. It's gaigog, which means liar in the language. And you might go like, why, why are they called liars? You know, they're supposed to be sharing these uh, traditions that go back way back, and they're supposed to be really important to, to tribal tradition. Why are they called liars? Well, the reason it, 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 it traces to Cherokee language. Um, in our language, um, it's a very specific language. There's 20 pronouns. It's a very specific Iroquoian language. And, um, and if you weren't there to actually witness something personally, then you, there's a suffix added to a verb, to our polysynthetic verbs, which indicate that it's as told to knowledge. So, so unless you're standing right there and saw something, anything that was told to you of the past is something that you would say, you know, it would basically be something to added to like, so it's been said, or so I've been told. And now when you talk about those traditions that go way back, right, that talk about the times when animals could talk Cherokee or these mythic traditions that go way back into the past, 
Well, they start to stretch the imagination. And so Cherokee knowledge is very uh, upfront about that, playing with the pun of liars and lying, you know, signaling to that it, it really is up to the individual to make sense of these traditions and how they mean have meaning in your own life. Um, and so it plays on that with that Gaia Gog term. We have another term for accounts, like a historical account, which is called a, a Kanoheda, which, but that's a different kind of thing. Um, the stories that they were telling were the ones that, uh, that stretch the imagination, our mythic traditions. We wanted to create a book object, something to stand next to all those other books about Cherokee peoples. Um, the Cherokee are probably one of the most written about Native American tribes, and, um, but um, the vast majority of those book, books are by non-Cherokee people. And there was a lot of consternation about that when we started to work on this project. A book, a book about Cherokee storytelling hadn't been told in something like 40 or 50 years. And so we wanted to, tell, wanted to write a book together that could stand next to those other books and people could look to at and actually tries to talk about the community from a community perspective. And so that's what we created. The stories that are contemporary, but also of the mythic times that talk about our origins and really talking about the whole purpose of storytelling, which is not about, you know, as I learned through the process and really working for years with, with my elders, not so much about the stories, which are important, right? But it's about the relationships that those stories create with one another, right? With our ancestors, with each other, the community that they bring together. That's the power of storytelling, is to bring us together into relationship. So this was an honor to work with them, and, um, but I also knew what I, was, what I was in store for in working on this, this book, because this is on a whole other level, to talk about the Cherokee cosmos and natural world, and try to present it to a variety of readers. But that was our task. Now I realize I've been talking about Cherokees, uh, but you probably, maybe, some of you don't know about who we are, so I wanna take a little bit of a backtrack and tell you about uh, just give you a thumbnail sketch um, of Cherokee people. Um, the Reader's Digest version is what some elders would say. Um, so the Cherokee are the largest tribal group that exists within the boundaries of the United States today. You may not have known that. We have more than 400,000 tribal citizens in three federally recognized tribal governments. The Cherokee Nation, whose reservation overlaps the 14 northeastern counties of the state of Oklahoma, which you see here. Uh, the United Katua Band of Cherokee Indians, also located in northeastern Oklahoma, and the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, whose reservation lands are in the far west of the state of North Carolina. Uh, for Cherokees, home is the Smoky Mountains. Um, this is our original Cherokee territory, where it's been documented that people have lived there for well over 11,000 years. We still call it Jalagi Uweti, uh, the old Cherokee country. Our mythical traditions say that we actually had um, several stops before we ended up in Oklahoma. That's, Oklahoma's our fourth place we've ever lived. We talked about beginning as a people, living on an island surrounded by water you couldn't drink. Some people speculate that's somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico and that we had to leave that place. There was another place we lived with a place of giant turtles that we lived, but there was a transgression that was committed against those, those creatures and we had to live there, leave there as well. So we have a whole tradition of, le of moving on beyond different places before we settled in the American Southeast, what's now the American Southeast. Um, and we had different languages as well. So there's a lot of tradition that goes back with those oral traditions about who we are as a people. But this is our most recent place. And as people have told me, you know, and, and, and our prophecy says, we're not guaranteed a fifth place. We're not guaranteed another home, is what we're told. So we can let that settle in. The Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians Tribal Nation remains here in the Southeast. Um, and there's close contact with the Eastern Band, which is located in far western North Carolina. And people coming back, go back and forth all the time between out west and in east. And as I mentioned before, how we ended up out west, right, in this territory, was through the, tr the Trail of Tears uh, event. Uh, the ethnic cleansing of the American Southeast, uh, which happened for us in 1838 and 39. And we still hold that tradition and know about these things. I know my family was on the drain detachment. I know their names. And these things are really, we, we hold that history close to us. And yet we de we're bound and determined not to be defined by it as well. From 4,000 to 8,000 of our 20,000 population at that time perished um, along the Trail of Tears, um, along that forced migration. With such a large population, Cherokee peoples are diverse. We're a very diverse people. We live all over the world with large populations in California. A lot of Cherokees moved there during the Dust Bowl era. You might have seen that Dorothea Lange picture with the Cherokee woman with child. 
one of the most famous images of the Dust Bowl era, that's a Cherokee woman, right? Um, Cherokees are in Texas. Washington State has a large Cherokee population. So we're diverse in every way, racially, culturally, politically, and religiously. Our nations have different criteria for citizenship and different histories for each of our tribes. So when I speak of Cherokee tradition right here, and why I'm giving you this context is to, to acknowledge that those traditions are, are specific to the knowledge keepers with whom I work, the, the work that comes out here. This isn't speaking for all Cherokee peoples. That would be impossible. This is for a small segment of, of Cherokee um, cultural knowledge keepers and leaders, um, very respected people. But our, our nation is so vast that there's no way one can make a claim to being authoritative about Cherokee tradition. So, and now as we begin this, this discussion of Cherokee earth dwellers, I wanna, I wanna acknowledge my own relation to this cultural knowledge, you know, and, I, and you know, give some background of who I am a little bit, because it's important. You know, when we do indigenous studies research, we always wanna locate ourselves. Who, you know, who is the person speaking, right? And I gave a little bit at the beginning, but I wanna say that you know, I'm a person um, who came to work with these elders and knowledge keepers not because I was born into that, um, you know, as a, you know, into a family of fluent speakers. I was not. I learned to, you know, um, Cherokee as a second language learner. I, I wasn't taught a lot of these traditions growing up, like a lot of Cherokees. Um, but when I came to work with some of them and came to, um, to learn from these elders, I was taken in. And within our tradition, everyone's considered to have a role and responsibility. Everyone. When you look at our tradition, and I, I'll talk about it a little bit when I tell the story, if I get a chance, I'll, hopefully we can do that today, I'll tell you the story of water spider and the origin of fire. Cherokee storytelling traditions always focus on the smallest, most insignificant creatures. They always become the ones that are, that are the ones that are needed. We as a people are very inclusive that way. We've always been that way. Our traditions focus on that. You know, when we fo formed our Cherokee Scholar Society years ago, a society of, of scholars who work in academia, we were counseled by the late Benny Smith. He, he, he looked at all of us who were starting this, this group and said, just be yourself. That's all you need to be, just be yourself. Just don't aspire to be anyone who you are. You have a role to play. So I have a role to play. I came in, I said, they said, well, you're a writer, you're a scholar, you, you're, you're, um, we'll put you to work. And that's what they did. That's what my elders did with these works. So I'm reminded of also of the words of Aboriginal scholar Tyson Young Caporta, who in his book, uh, Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World, which is a really great read if you haven't heard of it. He writes of his ancestral knowledge shared with him. He says, I can speak from the knowledge, but not for it, or about all the details. However, I can talk about the processes and patterns I, I know from my cultural practice, developed within my affiliations with my home community. And I feel the same way. I can, sp I can speak about it, but not for it. This knowledge is vast. This is just kind of a, a necessary caveat as we kind of get into it. Um, and so with humility, we kind of began our work on the Liars Club book. Here's a picture of Loretta Shea talking to an elder. Um, when we went over the, the material, we realized it was vast. Over 600 animal names, plants, birds, fish, reptiles, trees, insects, and it was doing more than just portraying these these, the, the Cherokee world with names and, st and, uh, and stories. Originally, when I met with Loretta, she said, maybe we should do a dictionary. But as we started to thumb through it and kind of look through this material and work through it, we realized this is talking about the Cherokee cosmos as a whole. It's not, ta it's not something that could just be a language resource. But as a language re uh, teacher, uh, Loretta thought, well, you know, it would be useful in classes and that kind of thing. And it was, it would be. But it's more than that. It was portraying a whole Cherokee world that when Hastings began to document this work and to take those notes down in the 1970s, that world wasn't under threat as it is today. Today, there are approximately 2,000 fluent speakers of Cherokee language. Our nation is spending millions of dollars doing our darndest to try to perpetuate the language. We have online language classes. We have um, immersion, an immersion school. We have adult uh, language programs that are just working as hard as they can to, to increase our speakers. But you know the average age of speakers is you know is older, right? It's in uh, in the 60s or 70s, and these people are passing on. So we're to race against time, and Loretta knew that. But when Hastings started taking this material down years ago, it wasn't such an important thing to um, to document the Cherokee cosmos and how people understood it, because there was a lot of people who actually had grown up that way and understood Cherokee worldview in a very kind of traditional way, grounded in the language. So. I remember asking Loretta, you know, why are we doing this? What's this all about? What's you know what? 
What's the goal of, of this work? And it came down to sharing what Hastings said is to stand in the middle, right? To learn these things because it's imperative that we know them in order to live in a good way in a Cherokee cultural context. We need to know our relations. It's not optional. And we need to know them within our own language and within the stories. They are what kind of uh, constitute our value system. So that was, uh, that was the impetus. So we got together and created a goal for the work. And the, the, the challenge was vast. Um, how do we take a collection of names, an archive of material, and turn it into a book? How does one turn a collection of words, anecdotes, and stories into a book reflecting a traditional understanding of the Cherokee natural world? Well, you do it as a community. You create it as a community. That's what it came down to. So Loretta reached out to other elders, other language teachers, other language speakers, and we got together, and we started to go over the Hastings material, and I began to record it. And she would ask questions, and we would start to kind of parse together all the different kind of ways in which people started engaging this material and started to understand the value system that people took for granted, right? It's, a, it's really difficult, actually, to ask people, like, you know, what's your worldview? <laughs> we don't really kind of think about it in those terms. And that was one of the things that we realized when we started working on this, this project, is that um, so many times, we, you know, we live through embodied practice. And people would say, you know, if you're gonna, you can't talk about nature as an abstraction, right? If you think about the natural world that way, it's so common to, to people talk about nature, throw that, that concept around. Uh, in Cherokee, nature is unetlana uwotlana, like what creator made. And, you know, it's a general kind of abstract way, but if you talk to people about, um, well, what does it mean to farm? What are, the, what are the things you need to know to begin in that, to be part of that practice? Or to hunt? How do you need to know the inageanehi, the forest, right? Um, fishing has its own terminology. All these different kind of embodied practices people could talk about. Not everyone knew about them all, though. And so we had to kind of triangulate. One elder would know about what, it, what life's like, um, you know, traditional knowledge having to do with the forest, forest. Another would talk about fishing. Another would talk about farming. And we'd meet with those people and start recording these things, right? All friends of the Shade family who took part because of their great respect for Hastings Shade and Loretta Shade and what they were, they were about. Um, so this is what we started to do. Talk about, talk with community, work with community. And the thing that we had to work with is also in terms of the organization of this work. Imagine having the responsibility as we, as we took upon ourselves to try to present Cherokee ways of knowing in a book form. How do you do that, right? And what kind of organization do you have to do that? That became a big topic. Um, we might have, you know, one of the things that we discussed was this idea of Linnaean taxonomy. How do you even think about the natural world in terms of creatures? How do you classify it? These are things we take for granted today, right? We think of you know, kingdom, phylum, all these different kind of ways we were taught as kids. But what would they look like if you were going to actually kind of decolonize that way of thinking and think about them uh, within a traditional Cherokee way of knowing the world? Where do they fit? How do they relate to one another? How are they defined against each other? That's what we started to take upon ourselves, and it was a lot of heavy thinking and work to do it. So, did I do that? Let me see. Is that... So this is how we did it. We did it through conversation. We did it through modeling, teaching, and learning through story and lived experience, through sharing creature names and teachings of the importance of our, of our, um, of our naming in our, in our world, through exploring what it means to, for humans to stand in the middle, and by modeling these through conversation, through stories, and through presenting the creature names. And we decided to organize the book through the Cherokee way of uh, knowing the world through a three-tiered cosmos. Um, And basically, the one thing that we wanted to really get at is, you know, to answer the question for the everyday reader, right, whether they're Cherokee or non-Cherokee, why do we need to know about the creatures we share this world with? What does that really matter, right? How is that knowledge not just abstract, but has real meaning in our everyday lives? So here are the folks that worked on this with me. There's Larry Shade on the far left. Here's Se there's Sequoia Guess in the middle with uh, the Doctor Who fan with the TARDIS on his sweatshirt. Loretta Shade, myself, and, and uh, Woody Hansen are among some of the folks that we worked with. So we started to organize this work around the Cherokee cosmos. And we decided to, um, 
to create a work that could speak to Cherokee people who know this world, who don't know this world, and also um, to everyday audience, right? To a general audience and readership. And that's a tall order to speak to all those different audiences and explain things. But that was the task at hand because that's where our reality today. Some people have grown up with these traditions, the vast majority have not. You know, um, and so how do you reintroduce that knowledge into, in a way that people can access it, access it um, and understand it, but also don't, um, don't water it down, right? Present it in the way it's supposed to be understood in, in our traditional ways. Um, so in the Cherokee way of thinking about the world, we live in a living world, a living cosmos. Um, Galalahi, the sky world, which is above us, it said it's defined by this kind of um, vault-shaped um, cover that encloses our sky. All the creatures of the sky world, the flying creatures, they're the communicators <clears throat> in Cherokee ways of being. The birds teach us how to, to, to talk. Um, they share so many stories. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they're the communicators. That's where we get so many stories about communication and the value of communication come through our stories about birds, right, and those creatures. The middle world, Elohi, those are the other creatures who live on the earth, a place of human beings. This is a, a new, ever-balancing place. When we talk about that idea of tohi, of finding some kind of sense of balance or, or peace or flow, that goal of standing in the middle, it's with relationship to the, work, the world we live on, this middle world, a balancing world. And then there's Elohi Hawina Ditla, the underworld. Those are the, that's the home of the creatures that live underwater and under the earth, a place of dynamic, chaotic energy, a place underwater. Our task as human beings in Cherokee ways of knowing is to stand in the middle, to find balance <clears throat> among sky, earth, and underworld energies through teachings, relationships, and communication. So I showed you this, I have this, um, Um, this image of the Cox Mound Gorget. This is an iconographic, um, a classic iconographic image from Southeastern Ceremonial Complex. And it's one that we identify as Cherokee people and have a lot of meaning for, um, that attach to it. This, um, and I'll show you how it works. It actually is a representation of the fire of the sun and the fire, its representation on earth, and of the four directions, and of the four winds. So it gives a whole kind of, kind of a cosmological perception of, of the Cherokee cosmos in this one kind of, um, this one image of above, above uh, below, and of course, Elohi on earth. And we get that sense of the center there, right where the fire is, that's where the center is. So as I started to get into this work, <clears throat> and started to look at the kind of philosophical way in which Hastings Shade was talking about our relations as human beings to the natural world and the way he was taught about what it means to be a human being in the world and what we're striving for, I began to have a clear idea of this standing in the middle. Hastings had created this uh, Cherokee body chart that exists in Cherokee Nation um, health clinics today, all over the place in different um, uh, contexts within Cherokee medicine, medicinal practice. And I started to kind of study it. And as I looked at it, there was a, you know, all the different kind of terms you can see on the right, I know it's fine print, you can't make it out, but all the traditional kind of um, names you'd find for body parts that you'd find in any other kind of um, anatomy chart. <clears throat> but there were other terms as well, terms like nightmare, um, um, terms like depression, um, other terms that started to kind of point to more than physicality as a part of one's health and being. And I started to kind of piece that together and working with Loretta, started to understand the relationship that he was talking about, about what standing in the middle and health and wellness really is within a Cherokee context. Um, Ayatli, that middle, this is also the kind of symbolic of the fire, right? A place of di dynamic, sustainable balance. Ajila, fire is alive, a direct gift from Creator. In Cherokee tradition, we say one of the direct gifts we got from Creator was fire, another was tobacco. It's a symbol of life and consciousness. Tohi, that idea is, uh, you know, peace or flowing like a river, unblocked, is the condition of standing in the middle. That's health and wellness. So tohi oyela uh, is a peaceful body or a well body. So that's what the, the definition of wellness in Cherokee means, something that, that lives in a kind of peace and flow, 
The question is, of course, how do you get there? Like, how do you achieve that tohi oye lan, that peaceful body? How can you stand in the middle? And why do we need to know about creature names in the, our living world to get there? That's the big question. So we kind of started to actually kind of piece it together that standing in the middle is achieved through learning and experiences felt in the body, mind, and spirit. The body is a crucial to our sense of wellness because um, we learn it through being not offensive to other creatures, being respectful, living res you know, in a reciprocal way with those creatures, in relationship with other creatures. Um, I don't think I'll have time to talk about it today, but there's a story, of the Cherokee story of the, the teachings that have to do with um, the origin of, 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 um, of medicine and disease. And that story has to do with human beings um, have a hand in creating disease by being offensive to animals. We offend animals, we overhunt them, we disrespect them, and in turn, they plague us with disease, right? And when I teach classes, I often talk about that and say, well, what kind of diseases come out of, you know, of um, the type of, you know, mass manufacturing of meat today, for example? What kind of diseases come out of that? Are the animals being treated well in those situations, right? And the old story about the origin of medicine and disease, the deer plague us with rheumatoid arthritis for not respecting them and not giving thanks when we take their life. And it's only the plants that actually stand up and say, we'll help you out, we'll give you medicine. And in Cherokee traditional ways of thought, we still have that kind of difficult relationship with animals and we still have to be wary of treating them with respect or they'll plague us with disease. It's only the plants that, you know, that will help us out with medicines, right, and help us. So in terms of the body, in terms of tohi oyela, it's not just a kind of frivolous kind of understanding of the natural world that's kind of necessary just because it's a good thing to know. It actually helps save your life. If you don't know those creatures' names and you don't know how to treat them respectfully, they'll kill you, right, in a Cherokee way of thinking, right? So tohi oyela is about finding one's place with relationship to those creatures. And you do that through knowing their names, through understanding their history, from knowing their stories, through being able to relate to them in a healthful you know, way, as, as in a respectful way. In the mind, in terms of mind, it's teachings that shared through stories um, and personal reflection, not coercion. As I talked about originally um, in, at the beginning of the talk, you know, when you hear these stories that stretch the imagination, these stories of the Gaia Gog, you know, no elder will say, you need to know this, you have to learn this, you have to accept this. Stories are always told and in a very open-ended way. As Hastings would say, when you tell a story, you let it ride. You just let it flow. You don't try to teach someone uh, what the inter proper interpretation is. Now, as a trained literary scholar, that's been hard at times <laughs> to resist that temptation to go like, hey, look for here, look, you know, look at this meaning. But when you teach students, as I'm teaching right now, I'm teaching a storytelling class with, um, with Roger Fernandez, the Klalem, um, Lower El Klalem, um, you know, renowned storyteller. And he and I are sharing a lot of stories in class, telling oral traditional stories. And we'll just have to let them ride and see what the students are gonna get out of them. Everyone's gonna get something different out of them. But if you don't share them, no one's gonna have access to that knowledge. So sharing those teachings through this book was crucial to get those teachings out into the world for people that may not have heard them or may not have come across them. The spirit is this other aspect um, that we relate, you know, our relations through knowing names, stories, creatures of the world, acknowledging them, connecting our spirits together Right? That's, how we, that's how we start to tie together relationally, and that brings health and wellness. Okay? So acting upon this knowledge by practicing land-based customs, sustain relationships. It's not just about abstract knowledge. It's about going out into the world. It's about going to those places. It's about relating to them in an everyday way. That's you know, part of how Cherokee health and wellness works, and that's why it's tied to the natural world. That's why it's tied to naming practices. So in the last few minutes here, I want to kind of jump to like why we're talking about names and why we have a book with over 600 different names of the creatures of the natural world into it, in it. Well, naming within, um, within Cherokee practices is just, um, it's, it's fundamental. Um, I'm reminded of the religious scholar, Mircea Iliade, who argued that what we cannot name is not fully real or fully experienced for us. Naming the world creates it in a powerful sense. If you don't know those names of those creatures, how can you relate to them? I remember sitting with Loretta one day at the branch restaurant, and 
she, which is the Northeastern State University is right in downtown Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And there were kids walking around, college students. And she was saying, I bet a lot of those students can't really name what those trees are right here. And I don't even, and, and, and you know, I agreed with her. And I know that's for myself as well as for a lot of people. We can't name the things that we share this existence with. What are the names of the trees that we run across day by day? You know, what are the names of the plants, the birds we see? We may know a robin, a crow, but do you know the names of those other creatures, right? In a very basic sense. So Loretta thought, you know, as, as I've been talking about in a traditional way, that's so crucial to have that understanding. When we talk about names, when I say like my name in Cherokee, it's Noe. When I say Noe Dagwadoa, it means Noe I'm called. More than once repeatedly, that prefix D at the beginning of Dagwadoa makes the verb distributive, referring to a being with multiple qualities, characteristics, and relations. So I'm not a single thing. I'm a thing in relationship. You know, Noe, that thing that has relationships. And one is named by others. So the names of creatures tell us a great deal about who they are, how we relate to them, and how we understand them. Um, it's crucial. So when I bring this stuff up, um, I want to talk about it in terms of traditional ecological knowledge. And in the stories that you'll find in this book, and that um, there, like I said, a lot of mythical stories, a lot of stories about talking animals, things that kind of would stretch the imagination. And I know a lot of folks today will go like, how is this a work of like traditional ecological knowledge? Or what, how is this a work that can relate to, to, you know, in a very kind of a straightforward manner to sharing knowledge of, um, of how to be in the world today and not just what in a very kind of um, watered down version would be called myth, right? Just kid, stories for kids, right? So I'm gonna just kind of take a, a slight diversion here as we kind of reach the end and talk to you about how these stories are both internally and externally true and why they're so powerful in that sense. You know, long ago, Greek philosophical tradition came to realize that their gods, right, in the Greek context, exist both externally and within one's mind or psyche. In fact, they argued it's the divinity within the mind which allows for the projection of divinity in the external world. Natural laws and processes were understood as expressions of divinity as well. With this philosophical development, it wasn't as if Zeus or other deities ceased to exist in the external world, but as religious scholars have pointed out, the Greeks realized the inner and outer worlds are the same reality viewed from different perspectives. And I think that's the same thing, what we're kind of, or a similar kind of dynamic that we're working on with Cherokee oral tradition. Some of these stories in, in this work about rabbit or about the other animals that, that are talking to one another. I remember talking to, to Sequoia Guess about it and asking, you know, when we talk about rabbit, like in this book, you know, like, you know, is that when you look around, you, is, you know, and you see a rabbit hopping down the road, is that like is that rabbit? Is it the same kind of rabbit? Or are we talking? Are you talking about symbolically? I mean, and he said, no. It's I don't I don't differentiate the two. They're both the same, right? Our way of thinking about those creatures, um, our understanding of them from a human perspective as an animal, right, and as something that's symbolic and powerful and has a has its existence in and of itself that reflects back on us. That it's not just a part of our own projection of what that animal is, is fundamental to a Cherokee way of being in the world, that these things have their own, own reality to them and that we're kind of, we're connected to them in that way. And that comes through with our clan laws and all these different creatures. So it's traditional ecological knowledge. And um, as we kind of, I'm gonna take a, just a few more minutes here, but one of the things I'm reminded of with this was that we, when we started to put together this work, we were really um, interested and we needed to, to um, present as many creatures as we could. And I was very, very fortunate to have the Cherokee artist, Mary Beth Timothy, agree to illustrate the work. And we worked on it a long time, um, especially you know, trying to figure out how many different creatures we could illustrate. Because Loretta Shade had give us, given us you know, the mandate to, you know, I asked her, which creatures should we, should we illustrate? Which are the most important? And she was like, all of them. <laughs> and she couldn't, she couldn't say which ones, but we had to narrow it down. So we narrowed it down to 66 different creatures that we illustrated. And some well-known, but a lot not well-known. And one point, we talked about water spider. And water spider's that creature, uh, Kananeski Amai, we, we call her. She's the one that brought us fire. She's the one that, that um, when all the other creatures tried to 
to get, get fire for us. She was, the, she was the, the final one always asking, let me try, let me try, and they would never let her try. He said, you're too small, you can't do it. She finally got her chance when all the other animals tried to get fire for us. And when they tried to get fire for us, they all changed. In Cherokee way of thinking, they say that the animals all were snow white at one point. But when they tried to get fire, they got their color. When the bear got too close, he got this you know, nice tawny color on him. The black snake got burned and turned black. The crow was snow white before it too, also got turned black by trying to get the fire for us. It was only the water spider that could do it. You know? And she's the one that could, that could swim underneath the water and she evaded these creatures that are called the fire giants who were guarding the fire and this giant sycamore tree on this island. And so it was a powerful story and it's one that's fundamental to us as Cherokee people. You'll see it all the time on Cherokee iconography. And uh, so Mary Beth started working on the, on the illustration and then she called me one day and she's like, uh, Chris, she's like, um, what spider is water spider? And I was like, okay, well, let me give Loretta a call. So I called Loretta and it's, you know, you got to be kind of very careful about asking an elder, you know, these kind of questions because you don't want to put anyone on the spot. But I was like, uh, Loretta, you know, when we talk about water spider, kind of ask am I, which spider is she? And Loretta said, hmm, there's a pause. And she said, let me call another elder. And so she called another elder and they called another elder, and they talked to the Cherokee language uh, department. And, and the knowledge started to kind of come back to us. He said, well, we know it has like furry legs. We know that from another story. She has furry legs. And someone else said, well, her, her name means kind of like scissor-like. And then um, and I started to triangulate that with talking to Loretta and looking up different creatures. What are the, what, what are the different spiders that can dive underwater and can, and can skim over water in the Smoky Mountain region? What are the ones that can you know, create a little ball of, uh, like she does, a little kind of pot that she put on her back, that she put fire in and crossed those waters for us? What could look like that? And after working on it, we found that the creature that fit all those criteria is Dolomites tenebrosus, which is a jumping wolf spider. And after talking to other people, we we're like, that's it, that's water spider. Now it's important, like I said, you could say that's a mythical story. That's a story that's about, that tells us something about ourselves as a people, valuing the least among us. But there's also an environmental knowledge that exists in that story. And you can't divorce the two. They go together in a powerful way. So it would be an injustice to illustrate water spiders anything but who she is, the creature that our people knew. And what more knowledge is there for us to kind of find and, and as, we, as we think about this and what will come out of community when we think about that specific creature? So there's environment, environmental knowledge there as well that exists within this, as well as teachings that are for the spirit, for the soul, right? And that, that, um, that teach us about how to live in the world. So I think with that, I want to kind of end with a couple other things to say there are rocks within Cherokee life as well that have importance, like the ones we could talk about with El Capitan or in Yosemite. Here's a rock uh, called Judicola Rock, which is just outside of Colaby, North Carolina. And it's the rock with the most... Um, um, most inscriptions on it that you'll find east of the Mississippi in terms of petroglyphs. And it's, uh, it's a rock that we talk about, uh, Judicola, known in Cherokee tradition as the slant-eyed giant, was the creature, this being, that gave us all our hunting and um, farming practices. And he was the one that came down the mountain. They say he stepped on that rock. And you can see that image on the bottom right, this kind of footprint-like image. Um, that he stepped on that rock and it exists for us. So we, we know that place and we know Kolawi is a, is a, is a, a version of Judah Kolawi, Judah Kola's place. Um, and so we keep a, a long tradition of, of these natural features and our relationships through them and it's just a sacred place for us as Cherokee people. The other place that we have is uh, Pilot Knob. Judah Kola lived there too, as well as Cherokee first person, uh, Kanadi, the lucky hunter, and Shalu, corn woman lived at this very place, and we have traditions and teachings about this place, and keep those traditions alive. It's a state park now in North Carolina, but we know of it as one of our origin places, and have deep relationships with this place as well as a sacred place. Here's an image of the water spider, Kananeske Mai. So I just want to end by saying, you know, why strive for an storied world? Why, why look at the landscape in this way? Why continue to strive for it? Um, well, like with, with Water Spider, we encounter fire in that story, consciousness, and a gift from the smallest creatures. 
the seemingly insignificant parts of our world, ourselves, right? Even they, you know, something as insignificant and as ignorable as a little spider is central. That is the message that Cherokees have for our natural world. And in storied relational world strives for linguistic diversity. And in knowing about the world, you know, linguistic scholarship has shown there's a connection between biodiversity, biodiversity and linguistic diversity. You lose one and you lose the other. They go hand in hand. If we lose our relationships through our language, we start to devalue the world. A tree just becomes a tree. It's not a cedar tree with all the powerful teachings that come with it, it's just another tree. We're seeing that happen today, and it's another reason why we need to perpetuate our languages, our storied world. Um, I was glad to hear Layla talk about and, and Adam mention the places that we're at now. I've been here nearly 10 years at UW, and I'm still learning a lot about where we are, the stories about, um, about Changer, stories about Mount Tahoma, right? Stories about Snoqualmie Falls, you know, stories about the Maiden of Deception past, all these different stories about our world here that tie together and show the relationships, the deep and sustaining relationships and the values that embody this world. So I'm happy just to share a little bit of what I do, might give back a little bit what I can as a scholar to my own community um, and do the work I can do. And I was happy to be here with you here today. So thanks for your attention and listening. And I'm happy to answer any questions and have a conversation now. So well done. thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. I don't know about you all, but I have this kind of very warm feeling in my body, in my heart right now. Um, we have about uh, five to 10 minutes for questions. The, the museum um, closes at seven. Um, so I would love to invite anybody who has a question for Chris or two to just even come right on up here. And, and stand here at the mic, or you can raise your hand and I'll bring you the mic, whatever you prefer. Sure. Thank you. Hi, Chris, thank you so much for that great sure. talk, and I really we can't wait to, to read the book. Um, I just had a question about something you gestured to in different moments of your talk, and that's about the relationships between different forms of knowledge. Yeah. You know, you really kind of centered it in, uh, in the importance of, of, of language revitalization and thinking about different taxonomies. But given that you're introducing this within the, con within the context of a university where there's all kinds of noisy, you know, encounters between different kinds of knowledges, what, what have you learned uh, through this project about how native forms of knowledges live next to other forms of knowledges? And how do you yeah. think about that relationship? That's a great question. <clears throat> it's a constant process of, of translation, even like presenting a lecture in this format, you know. I probably would have preferred just to tell stories today <laughs> and let it ride, like let that knowledge ride. But we're in a kind of a, a institution um, in academia that it has a certain kind of approach towards analytical thought and explanation, right? That's one of the kind of privileged ways of approaching these things. But I've, as a scholar in indigenous studies, I've, I've you know, even after being in academia in like 20 years now, I'm still, I'm, I'm actively trying to push back and away from that mode of being. I'm teaching that class, like I said, with, with um, Roger Fernandez right now, and giving space for students just to engage a story and to let it work within them and to reflect on it is a powerful kind of way of dealing with the different types of form of knowledge, a form of sharing knowledge, and one that is a, you know, a, you know, a fundamental, um, practice of indigenous communities all over the world. So it's been interesting for me to reflect on that, the ambivalence about approaching that, which, you know, um, and, and accepting that as a form of my pedagogy and, my, and the work I do. And it's, it's came up all the time within this work as well, um, the ways in which, how do you present this work in a linear fashion, something, you know, that, in a way that, that doesn't follow a linear path, for example, chapter by chapter. So even thinking about like how, how, do we, how, how do we organize that knowledge? And that's why we organize the knowledge with a first chapter on standing in the middle and explaining that philosophical approach. And then the subsequent chapters on sky world, middle world, and underworld. Speaking about them as places and the creatures and values and traditions that, that circle around that place and live within that place. That was the way we as a community decided to portray that. 
but we are pushing back on conventional ways of organizing and understanding knowledge. So I think it's a constant, it's a constant process, and I think there's give and take. I think there's you know gains and losses. I mean, like there's there's ways in which we had to um, um, we have, have compromises in publishing, for example. You know, um, we would have preferred to have collective the book collectively authored. But once you get beyond like two two authors, it starts to kind of you know that doesn't fit well with mainstream publishing processes, right? So there's a ton of questions about that that I that I, mean, I I could talk more about it. But thank you for that question. Yeah, it's a, it was a, definitely and it continues to be a process of translation between different forms of of knowledge and expression of knowledge. Sure. Thank you, Chris. That was really wonderful. I've been thinking a lot about translation lately and about how do these words that we use in English diminish our understanding of indigenous practices in art history. I'm thinking about craft, the word craft, and how it really diminishes women's creations. I was intrigued, of course, by your explanation of the word liar, right? What are the English words that we use that sort of sometimes in Visibilize, that's not maybe a word, <laughs> make invisible, um, things that we should understand but don't because of the English translation, or your discussion of the word work and the responsibilities when you think of it in a Cherokee language context. So I guess I have sort of two thoughts, which is, A, do you have any other words that you find particularly either diminishing that English uses or enlightening that Cherokee brings us that you'd like to share? or how in a classroom, I'm always struggling as a settler scholar to bring indigenous language in, what's my responsibility there for all these different languages, but also to make sure that that's pushing back against the ways that English diminishes indigenous understandings. So those are my Thank thoughts. Thank you, that's a great question, Katie. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you can go down a rabbit hole of, of talking about terms and concepts and how and I could spend a lifetime, I probably will spend a lot, the rest of my career kind of working on, on some of these things that have come up. And it's powerful. I, I just read a, a book in manuscript about, um, that's gonna be coming out about the translation of the Cherokee Bible. And it's really super fascinating because it, it speaks to these similar things. Like for example, um, the translation of the word king in the Cherokee Bible is um, which means leader. It's what we use for leader, chief, judge. Like, there's no differentiation. It's not the king. It's not like, and like, how does that, cha how would that change the meaning of the Bible when Cherokee readers would read that and read, oh, it's just leader, right? Or the word for priest in there is our word for firekeeper, our traditional word for someone, a spiritual leader, right? So translation is so crucial and like that. And I think, um, so there are so many words that have, rich meaning like that, that change the way you understand these things. And there, at the same time, there are a lot of words that are just super straightforward, right? A lot of these creature names really just describe what they do, right? And that's enough. I mean, like, that was enough. It's like that differentiated them between different things. They're not, you know, it didn't have, not, not everyone has to be so kind of, you know, deep and rich, although the stories themselves are. So I, you know, I, I find some of these ones that describe, um, um, art, for example, diti los don't di, which means to measure something carefully, right? That's what it means. If you're talking to fluent speakers, say art, diti los don't di, just means to measure something very carefully. Like probably how someone was measuring something when they were doing some kind of traditional art, maybe maybe making something um, like um, clothing or something like that. I always want to know what's the deeper meaning of that. And sometimes you run aground when talking to fluent speakers. Because there's not many fluent speakers who are doing that kind of um, work in terms of semantics. You know, my, my good friend Ben Fry, who's at the University of North Carolina, soon to be at UNC Asheville, is, teaches Cherokee language. And he and I, you know, can kind of geek out on these things and spend lots of time talking about all the different ways in which those words have meaning, right? Um, um, and, but I think the work has to be done. A lot more work has to be done in, in terms of talking about what the translation of those things really mean. Um, and there's a lot of, of deep knowledge that can come out of that. And I had a taste of that in working with community on this book, right? And just seeing it scratch the surface and things opening up and, and the way it reminded people, looking at these creature names reminded them of other stories and teachings and other words. So, 
and, and in par as part of teaching and using those and using concepts, I would just encourage you just to continue to do so and give context, of course, to, to the way in which the, the, they're being used by the, the sources that you quote. But it's really helpful in talking about um, some of these deep philosophical concepts to, in, to ground them in indigenous language and to not just kind of gloss them over with an English translation that just doesn't really quite hit at what they mean within the language and with the people who um, are fluent speakers. More and more, we're seeing folks who are second language learners or, you know, um, or just kind of have a passing knowledge of the language use these concepts and terms within their work, within their, you know, whether it's in government or it's in academia or elsewhere. And I'm just you know, fully in favor of that. I mean, I think it's crucial and important. And any language we can get out into the world, uh, any indigenous languages, I think it's a, just a, it's a gain, a net gain for us. So thank you. Well, everybody, I think that we only had time for two questions this evening. Is that okay? Um, or Danielle? I, I, I think that um, it's about 10 to 7. So um, out of respect for my colleagues and, um, and all of you who probably had a lovely long day, um, hopefully, um, just, let's, let's, let's just say thank you to Chris one more time. Thank you Thanks so much. You, thank you. <laughs>